welcome to this episode of Olsem Wanem. I'm Florence John Duo. Now, before we continue with this week's episode, we, the Olsem Wanem team, would like to wish all our viewers and the people of this beautiful country, Papua New Guinea, a happy 43rd independence. Now, back to the program. Three weeks ago, the Manam volcano in Medang province erupted, causing severe damages. More than 5,000 men, women and children were left without food and clean drinking water. Despite relief supplies being dispatched following the eruption, long-term solutions involving the resettlement of the Manam Islanders remain uncertain. Medang-based MTV journalist Mata Lewis visited Manam Island a few hours after the eruption and files this story. Manam Island, located off the coast of Medeng, is an island on its own. More than 5,000 men, women and children live here. To get to Manam, it takes about half an hour on the boat. From the distance, Manam looks peaceful, ideal and laid back. But it is not until when you land on Manam that you get a sense of feeling about the ordeals faced by the people who live here. There are cases. There are cases like um, asphalt. Now this one. One block place by Kim say uh, affected by uh, thread blown lava flow. Huh? But garden blown by stuff you're right. Yeah, place uh, place by that um, asphalt. This one kind. So damages are different long outlook long lah. Manam is an active volcanic island. The lives of the people on the island have never been better. Ongoing level of volcanic activities have rendered the island unsafe to live in. A few of the Manam people have been moved to care centers in Bogia, while others continue to live on the island. On the 25th of August 2018, the Manam volcano erupted yet again, sending more than half of the remaining population of the island fleeing for their lives. Food gardens were destroyed, village water holes were rendered unsafe to use as the volcanic ashes have destroyed them. Basic government services such as schools and health clinics were closed. <laughs> Every day, the islanders worry about the education and health of their children. They worry about their food and water sources, and they worry about the future of their younger generations. The concerns of the people haven't changed in the past 14 years. They want the government to assist them. Their main concern is centered around acquiring a permanent resettlement. Night me will stop and me will fret. You know, me will not sleep good. Even community too. Me will stop and me will fret. So me will appeal to government. Government can look look low. Or some this situation me will stop long and me will need to move. The recent eruption on Manam three weeks ago is not the first and it won't be the last. Volcanologists at the Rubble Volcanological Observatory are confident the volcano activities on the island won't end. Volcanologists can probably say when an eruption may start, but after it starts, it is quite a difficult to say when it will stop. And so, for the uh, case of Manam, uh, Manam is a uh, volcano that uh, produces an eruption and it sort of goes on for many weeks and sometimes uh, it can turn into uh, months. There was a mild eruptive activity that has been uh, going on for the past uh, maybe two or three months. And, and so we have that, uh, we know about the uh, behavior of uh, Manam uh, in that sense. And so now that 
from the eruption of uh, Saturday morning uh, a week ago, uh, how long will the uh, eruption uh, continue? Uh, I'd like to, I, I, we spoke to uh, the member for Bogia and the, uh, uh, Mr. Martin Mose, uh, the acting director for uh, the National Disaster Center, that we cannot say when the eruption will uh, stop. In fact, the eruption has uh, already stopped, but there is a question on whether eruptions will continue. And so I gave, an, um, I gave a, a message to say that uh, we'd like to uh, give about uh, three to four months in which to try and uh, you know, monitor whether renewed uh, activities, uh, eruptive uh, activities will, will uh, re-emerge again. Subsequent eruptions in the last 14 years have made life difficult for the Manam people as the small island rose from the ashes only to be destroyed again. Mr. Luki Molgamani said, Come on, Mr. Karam, come on, them all. All boxes, yeah, ballot box, them, because I bought him all now, all his tap way. Me being a harem was them, only like giving me for the Nupla ground here, and we have been waiting for that long. How long are we going to wait? But unless long-term solutions, such as relocating the people to a permanent settlement, is taken, the Manam people will continue to suffer. It's a battle against nature that shows no sign of them winning. If the government of the day doesn't want us to be a liability to the government of the day, we, we need to be resettled properly uh, in a, in a long-term sense, in a long, now that's all. Watching Olsemwanem, the Rabal Volcanological Observatory in East New Britain province monitors up to five active volcanoes around the country. The immediate evacuation of people away from danger zones hinges the operations of the Rabal Observatory. MTV's Kokopo based journalist Edwin Fidelis has this story. At the Rabaul Volcanological Observatory, senior volcanologist Ima Itikarai the head of the station is monitoring a series of recent earthquakes that happened in the past few hours. The data obtained from these screens are very vital. The Rabaul Volcanological Observatory is part of the Department of Mineral Policy and Geohazard Management. Its primary focus is to monitor volcanoes and earthquakes. Uh, besides uh, the volcano and uh, earthquake monitoring, uh, we also have a couple of instrumentation that are monitors uh, tsunamis. In an event of a volcanic related disaster, such details are of very high importance that will be used to issue alerts and evacuations of people away from danger zones. Like the Manam people of Medang and the Matupit people of East New Britain province, they continue to live in danger zones where there are volcanoes with the ever present risks of an eruption. We work at closely with the uh, provincial disaster offices and so the provincial disaster offices are responsible for um, what formulating uh, what they call uh, evacuation plans for the uh, volcanoes and so the Rabal Volcano Observatory provides uh, information about uh, you know, monitoring uh, parameters and the areas of uh, hazards uh, that, are probably, uh, that comes about due to, uh, due to the uh, eruptions and so the provincial uh, disaster office uh, used that information to try and compile the uh, evacuation plan. Apart from the technical information supplied by the observatory, many who continue to live in the high-risk areas depend on their past experiences to anticipate any disaster, something that they have become accustomed to. The station uses sophisticated equipment to assess the level of volcanic activities, but in recent years, the observatory is faced with new issues to deal with. Most of the equipment that are used to monitor volcanic activities are becoming obsolete, and to a larger extent, collecting and disseminating accurate information has been a big challenge for the center. During these uh, years, uh, we have uh, used uh, different uh, technologies to try and uh, use them for monitoring. The main uh, 
instrumentation or technology that uh, we have used is uh, for seismic uh, monitoring and there was uh, another one uh, that measures uh, ground deformation and so earthquake uh, recording is uh, the most common type of uh, instrumentation that our volcano observatories are used to try and uh, detect uh, what may happen in a volcano in terms of uh, uh, leading up uh, to an eruption. Uh, however, since then, um, that uh, technology, uh, the electronic uh, altimeters, have uh, discontinued because uh, of two reasons. One is that um, our facility at uh, Manam was uh, destroyed by uh, people uh, on the island. And so we had to uh, move from there to uh, another place where we couldn't reinstall that uh, instrumentation. <coughs> uh, the other reason is that uh, uh, things have uh, advanced in terms of our technology. And so that instrumentation uh, uh, support has a uh, sort of assist. And so we couldn't uh, continue uh, with that instrumentation. However, we have uh, continued to uh, use the uh, seismology uh, to try and uh, detect uh, the volcanic changes. On the 25th of August 2018, the Manam volcano in Medang erupted. The eruption has put the capability of the observatory to test. Master Itikara confirmed that in the hours leading to the Manam eruption, the observatory did not receive any volcanic data as there was a communication breakdown between the Rabao station and Manam Island. But before the uh, eruption happened, we had uh, connection uh, problems between the uh, remote site at Manam in Bogia and uh, here in Rabaul. The internet uh, connectivity uh, was off. Uh, the alerts were started to be produced about 3 a.m. in the morning. The eruption happened uh, between 5 and 6 in the morning. So we had about uh, three to, uh, two to three hours of uh, uh, lead time in which the alerts, alerts were produced but they couldn't be sent out uh, to the uh, people for you know warning and so and so because as I said, uh, the internet connectivity uh, was down. Numerous attempts by the provincial government and the affected people to have them relocated were unsuccessful because they keep coming back. A combination of land issues and simply the feeling of unwelcome into a foreign land has prompted the people to return to live in their disaster-prone villages. All this when coupled with the struggles faced by the observatory it is a much bigger problem for those who live in the danger areas. Ongoing financial constraints have put the people in the affected areas at a point of disadvantage. In recent years, more concerns have been centered around plans and strategies to address the issue of volcanic-related disasters and its impacts on the lives of the people. And with ongoing volcanic activities and lack of meaningful actions from the government, many regions in Papua New Guinea, like the Manam Island, will be displaced by the nature's onslaught. Relocating people to safer areas would mean negotiating with other traditional landowners who, for the most part, are unwilling to give up their land. It's been a painful experience for those who live in disaster-prone areas, such as in Matupit or Manam, where the people chose not to leave their customary land. Subsequent eruptions on Manam has prompted the PNG government to pass the Manam Resettlement Bill in 2016 a major breakthrough that is expected to provide answers to the plights of the Manam people. But many call it a faceless bureaucracy as its implementation and impacts are so far from reality on the ground. Welcome back to the program. In this segment, we feature the Inclusive Education Resource Center in Vanimo, West Sipik Province. The Resource Center is part of the Catholic-run organization called Kalan Services, which is dedicated to the training of teachers to teach persons and children with special needs. MTV News journalist Stanley Over Jr. visited the Resource Center recently and has this story. The Vanimo Inclusive Education Resource Center is a center that trains teachers on how to teach children with special needs. First established in 2013, the center provides in services to primary and secondary school teachers 
to align their teaching plans and lessons to cater for special needs children. The programs that we normally give to the teachers, sometimes we give um, sign language training to the teachers and we give um, in service on special education, uh, other areas on special education, like how to help children with learning difficulty in the classroom and also how to accommodate children with other disabilities as well in the classroom. The Vanimo Centre is part of the Kalan Services Network a network that is dedicated to allow persons with disabilities participate and contribute meaningfully to the society. They currently provide special education and community-based rehabilitation services to allow special needs children have access to inclusive and effective education. Uh, we get programs from the teachers and then we go in and assist them. If those children with um, special needs they lack some of the educational skills in the classroom. We assist them in the classroom as well. And from the Inclusive Education Resource Center, I think we accommodate all levels of education, from early intervention all the way to um, tertiary institution. Since 2013, the center has come a long way in terms of support from the government and the private sector, but more needs to be done. This is the audio room where the clients come in for any uh, ear and eye screening test. We have it here, but right now it's incomplete. We have the community-based rehabilitation office. This is where we have the volunteers. The volunteers come in for any referrals or um, any help they, they need from us, they come here. Mostly the uh, people outside in the community, they come here for ear and eye screening here as well for a time being. So we have um, our toilets, but right now it's incomplete. Our toilets are incomplete as you can see. We still need funding from some of our uh, donors or our government here in Sundown province. In this room, we have the center. This is the classroom where our children Children with disability, they come in for their classes where we attend to them inside this classroom. We don't have um, much here, but uh, we are hoping maybe later we'll have um, special rooms for uh, sitting arrangement for each of the children. These are some of our volunteers. That's Anna with hearing impaired. This is Polinos. And this is really, really is an hearing impaired volunteer as well, working with us here in the center. To conclude our episode for this week, we continue with the Inclusive Education Resource Center in Vanimo, West Sipic Province. As the center moves forward, it brings many new challenges. Senior resource teacher Wendy Jaliao says, with every program they run, they discover a new disability. We have identified some of the disability that we did not um, identify and some of the disability also it's quite new to us and also we are also learning on how to assist those children as well. Another challenge is the rollout of the standard-based curriculum and organizations like the Inclusive Education Resource Centre are pushing for every school in Vanimo to include this program in their teaching plans. Uh, we are going around also giving in service to teachers and training them on how to use special education in their planning and programming as well. Because most of the time the teachers, they forgot about their, the children with special need in the classroom. Sometimes they say they go with the child. And if the child who is very bright, they go with their child. But they did not consider their children with special need. But sometimes they will see that some of the children, they won't all have the white collar job. Some of them, they can go outside and work outside. We need people outside that can also develop our country. And what, what, uh, we, go, uh, what we normally do is we teach them how to plan for those children who academically cannot put words on paper, but they look at their abilities rather than look at their disabilities. 
and, and now in um, inclusive education also under government policy, um, for the standard-based curriculum, there are assessment tasks where they can um, give marks to the children and record the marks, and there are non-accessible tasks that they can give to the children. So this also accommodate for children with special needs in the classroom as well. And also we highlight some of the areas that children have in the classroom, like teachers, they have all kinds of disabilities in their classroom. They, they will say that they don't have any disabled child in their classroom, but there are always disabled children in their classroom. And we told them that if you cannot see their need and cannot see their talent, then you, the teacher, you have a disability yourself. However, the inclusive education program has brought classroom learning to a whole new level. One that is fascinating is the use of sign language. I use sign language in the classroom and the other normal children also, they also learn. And one, one thing I found it very interesting is that sometimes I sign, when I give dictation passages, I just sign the dictation passages and they just write it down, the whole, whole the deaf plus the normal children. And when I sign, I found out that two words that sound the same, it's, it's the signing that differentiates the word. If it's like there, there, they know what spelling to write. I've been into secondary um, examination room, and I saw that during the trial exam, I saw that when the student, they want the paper, they normally put their hand up and the teacher had to walk all the way from the front to the back and then ask what do you want and the, and the student will say I need paper. So the teacher had to come back all the way to the front to get the paper and back. So I said okay, one simple sign that it can help the teachers to move is just the sign of paper. So I, th I told them before the exam, I said okay, you can use the sign for paper so the invigilators can know that you need paper or if you need to go to the toilet or if you feel sick. And if you go to another country where you don't know their language, you use sign language. And I think most of the work of life here in, in, the, in the world, they normally use sign language. And as the country turns 43 years old, there are many positive signs ahead of organizations like this that are trying to make a difference in the lives of Papua New Guineans. And that's all the time we have for you on this week's program. If you have any comments or stories you would like to share with us, please send us an email via the address now showing on your screen or post it on our Olsen awesome 1M Facebook page. Until then, I'm Florence John Duo on behalf of the entire Olsen awesome 1M team. Thank you for watching and have a pleasant evening.